Unspoiled Network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering One Piece, episodes 464 through 466. A descendant of the beast, Little Oars Jr., full speed ahead. Justice for the winners and Goku's strategy in action. And Straw Hat Team arrives. Tension grows at the battlefield. In these episodes, we've got Oars. A little baby Oars. And it seems like he's like actually dead. And I just want to know who hurt Oda. Why does he need to do this to me? For what re- What did I do to you, Oda? This is extremely rude and heartless. And you are a hell beast. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Florian for commissioning this episode. Florian is here in the chat. And thank you, Florian, for uh, creating a character list. Uh, Florian's going to try and share it with me here in the chat. But it is something that I may like post in groups like on Facebook and stuff as well for other people to reference in case there's anybody else who's like sort of following along. I'm really, really curious, honestly, if there's anybody who listens to these Spoil Me episodes who hasn't watched One Piece already. Is there anybody who's following along and is like a total noob to this series the way that I am? Because if so, I definitely want to hear from you. Um, And you may not hear back from me if you message me or like email me. I have been so behind lately, you guys. I am so behind. But, uh, you know, I have to think that there's a, you know, somebody out there who saw the Netflix series and was like, let me start the anime because I liked this Netflix series and is finding themselves a little bit lost. And maybe I can be some sort of beacon for them. I don't know. But uh, I, <laughs> you guys, this show, there was a post in the um, the patrons only Facebook group where a, a woman was on stage doing some stand up bit, but it was the kind where you interact with the audience a lot. And she said, like, you know, any television show's plot line sounds completely insane if you describe what it is in, like, simple terms. Which is true. You know, really, like, pick a plot for a TV show and you're gonna sound nuts. But she then goes to the audience, somebody tell me the name of a show real quick, and somebody yelled out One Piece. And I was just like, that is such an unfair choice. That is easy mode. One Piece isn't even, I describe it to you and it sounds crazy. You watch it and it is crazy. There's nothing about this show that is normal. It, uh, there's nothing about it that falls within the lines of what you're used to with television, unless you are a big fan of anime already and you know like a lot of tropes and stuff like this. But it is, you know, she's describing it and yeah, it sounds bonkers because it literally is the weirdest fucking show I've ever watched. So why why are we putting that one out there? Choose something like Breaking Bad or, you know what I mean? Like The Wire, something that's got a more grounded premise because that's a more difficult thing. But anyway, just wondering out there if there's anybody. Um, so these episodes, like the first of the three is the one that's most focused really on baby oars. Now, I'm curious, and I don't know if there's actually an answer to this. Uh, You know, Florian may be able to answer. Uh, Why? Remind me why Oars was called Oars. Why is this little guy also called Oars? Like, I thought that I remember Oars being the name that was assigned, and I guess I must be wrong. So is, like, this dude, Baby Oars, essentially, is he really related or are they just talking to him like he's related or, or 
are the letters O A R S like an uh, anagram? Is it anagram? That's not the one I want. No, uh, acronym for something. Um, David says normal part of One Piece group of friends hang out and have wacky hijinks. That's the most normal that you can say, and that's really not adequate. You say that they have wacky hijinks, and I'm thinking wacky like, oh, there's a guy hiding in the closet because he doesn't want his friend to know that he was visiting so-and-so, like a threes company. That's what I think when I'm thinking wacky. They're not wacky, you guys. This is straight up bonkers banana pants town. That's what this is. Um, But Ors, it turns out, was like, you know, a friend of our crew, the Whitebeard crew, for a long time. And we have a whole thing with him getting a hat from Ace. I don't know what Oda's deal is with hats, but man, this dude fucking loves hats. Obsessed. How many people have their motivations like just boiled down to whether they're wearing a certain hat or not? It's truly hilarious in a way. Like, I'm not mad at it because it is the sort of thing that's like symbolic of your identity and like a, a role that you can take on or off depending something that can be easily gifted, but then just becomes such a signature part of your look that everybody associates you with it. You know, there's very few pieces of clothing that are the type of thing that can be worn at all times. You know, if somebody gives you like a t-shirt, you may be able to wear that t-shirt, but if you live anywhere where you have to put on a coat, then who cares about your t-shirt? If you are given a coat and you're somewhere warm, if you're given a, the wrong pair of shoes, you know, but a hat, everybody's going to be able to tell what the hat is all the time. So it is kind of like a neat and tidy way of, of putting uh, somebody's identity like up front and center. Um, and... I just, the, the fact that this little guy, and I call him little because in spirit, Ors Jr. is little. He is a giant man, creature, whatever. He's more than a giant, clearly. I don't remember if we ever find out exactly like what species he is, but Ors is towering over the giants he's got to be at least three times their size i feel like more than three times because he's like standing in the water in the ocean you know and sticking up out of it and i don't know that those giants could have reached him there once he's starting to get to land and approaching standing on the same surface that the giants are they're like at his knees maybe hips um and this dude in his flashbacks, he the first time that we see him like next to Ace, Ace is asking, aren't you hot? Because you're like closer to the sun. And he says, I am actually. Yeah. So Ace makes him a hat and we find out like he has to try a couple of times. Bless him. I just, you guys, there is nothing like, and you know, I really want to like, make it clear how I feel about this because I am a huge perfectionist, right? And so I am in the process still of making gifts for my friends to send to them. I'm going to be giving it as a Valentine's Day present, but they were meant initially to be Christmas and it was just like super not going to happen. So I've been working on stuff and have been obsessing over whether things are adequate for gift giving. And I have kind of lost sight of the fact that like, when I get a gift that's handmade by somebody, the last thing that I am looking at is whether or not they did an amazing, perfect job with it. And it's so, it's such a difficult thing for me to apply to myself. I know if I send my friends these like handmade things they're not going to be like, oh my God, do you see that she's like left some air bubbles in this resin? That's so embarrassing. Like they're never even going to notice, never mind criticize it. But I have this ridiculous standard in my head that I feel like I need to reach. And 
I get gifts that are handmade from friends. My mother, excuse me, my mother handmade me a scarf. I've gotten gorgeous handmade things when I was covering um, Harry Potter with Rashawn. I had a listener hand make me a flower, like a rose bouquet with every petal made from a, like, paper from a page of Harry Potter and paint and ev- it was gorgeous. It was so so beautiful, so stunning. Um another listener made me this giant crochet blanket that I use all the time that Pippin loves. I know for a fact that these things I could look at and find like oh there this was not done correctly. Have I done that? No. But I love them anyway. You know, Cam has made me a number of things and they're just precious because somebody took time and thought of me and made this with their hands. And it's not like buying a gift isn't meaningful as well, but it's just different when somebody has got like a craft that they decide that they're going to put that time into. So I really love the fact that it's not just that this is a hat somebody gave him. It's a hat that was specifically made for him and we find out that this hat, it was the third try. Ace tried two times and he attempted and kept burning it up, which is hilarious. <laughs> the fact that he just is is somebody who uses fire and apparently like didn't exactly know how to turn it off. And so kept lighting his little project on fire. Can you imagine? Anybody who's done like knitting or sewing or any kind of craft, if you had a like a, an ability that made it so that you might accidentally just send your project up in flames, how much would you just want to stab somebody in the throat every time? Kill me. It's hard enough when I've got something to show for it. Never mind when it's when I don't. So Ace eventually does make him this hat and it's really big it's funny though because like the show makes it like oh he doesn't get wet or doesn't get snow on him when he's wearing this hat even though he is so huge there's definitely snow all over him his whole body doesn't fit under the hat he's way too big for that but it doesn't matter the thing is that Orz is just delighted with it every time that they like ask him about it he has to say it in like a little rhymey way and it's a very very cute it's clear that like the fact that somebody took interest and made this expressly for him just means a lot to him and it does get me thinking and you know this is just my mind doing the things that it does where it just spins out into complete tangent ta- tangent areas where did ors get his clothes from who made him his pants and stuff. Where did he get them? Like, was there, did Oris have like a mommy who made him stuff and, and he just like left home and he's only ever had this one pair of pants. How, how did, do they find clothing or, uh, you know what I'm saying? It would be really, really funny if we got like a zoom in on his outfit and you saw that it was like patched together from like, 700 pairs of pants that he had sewn together to make fit him. So anyway, this whole thing is uh, like for the most part, this episode and there are other side things that I will get to is about Orr's making his way toward Ace. He is so determined to get there. And I think the plan is he's just going to reach out grab Ace, pick him up and like rip the chains out of the wall and then take off and go back to the ship and just put Ace like on the deck of the ship and they're going to leave. I think that was all he had planned, which frankly, if you're that big, yeah, I guess you can just do it that way. (laughs) But he's coming through and like everybody is unleashing on him. But this was the thing that kind of like bugged me a little bit was that there are all of these warlords that we know are capable of truly next level basically continent shifting shit and none of them does anything 
to stop wars until he is like there already. And so we've got all of these like soldiers who are just like, how are we supposed to fight him? And I'm like, I really don't think you are supposed to fight him. Your guys, your bosses are supposed to fight him. What are they throwing you out there for? This isn't going to do anything. You're not even big enough to like, like the, the swords they're trying to wield. It's like a toothpick, you know, and sure enough toothpicks. It's going to be very annoying and painful, but that's never going to kill me unless you manage to get them up in my eye sockets or something. So what the fuck, dudes? Step up. And they just like sit back and watch. And I'm like, I happen to know that you've got people out here who can, one, freeze the entire ocean, two, swing a sword from the shoreline and cut an entire ship in half. There's like all kinds of powers out there and none of you guys is lifting a finger. Why is that? And it's just really to like draw out the tension of everything and make it so that he's right there and almost at his goal when it all happens. And there is a part of me that is really side-eyeing that. When I said in my intro, like, Oda, who hurt you? It's just as much for the fact that, like, this was sad as it is that this was kind of manipulative. I have not met Baby Ors ever. You know, we get him at the very end of the last episode introduced as this dude who's, like, showing up out of nowhere. And then in this episode, we get the whole sad backstory. And this is, for me, one of those sort of, like, unforgivable sins a an episode of a television show that introduces a character, gives you their backstory to make you care, and then immediately kills them. If he's actually dead, which he may not be, because that doesn't seem to happen in the show, but I don't know, he seemed pretty dead. Um, and they, the only reason for us getting the backstory is so that they can, like, pull your heartstrings with this death. And... It works, like, better here than it works in the shows that I think of as, like, the primary, what's the word, offenders. Uh, Every single time that I bring up this trope, I will mention Walking Dead. It's just absolutely their MO. I don't know if in later seasons it stayed as bad as it was initially. But in that show... It wasn't necessarily that the character would have been introduced in the same episode. Oftentimes you would have had a character that was around, but very tertiary, like had two lines per episode max. And then all of a sudden you'd get an episode where they would have a lot more lines and you would get like a flashback to what their life was like before the zombie apocalypse. And you would see them do something really heroic and really fucking being crucial to the group all of a sudden. And any time that you started to see these things, it was an immediate giveaway. Oh, he gonna die. <laughs> he dead. That's what's happening. All they're doing is trying to, like, add this pathos to this death in the laziest possible way. Where it's just, you took no time to make us care about this person for, like, a full season that they were with us. And now all of a sudden you want to try and put all of that character development in one episode and then kill him like before that's even set in. Come on. They were the worst offenders with that. I won't try and say that this is as bad because honestly, it's not as bad. The writers of Walking Dead could learn something from One Piece, but it did kind of feel to me like, there was a lot that could have been done to handle baby oars further out. And we just didn't do that because drama, we just need the drama and nobody's reacting the way they ordinarily would or should. And it's a really tricky thing because you've got characters that can be really smart sometimes enemies who are, they are good at predicting what the, uh, their opposition is going to do and they have things like somewhat just enough in hand to make it feel like they're actually making an effort. You've got to balance that with them doing things that really make no sense at all. And to a degree, that's what we're getting in this arc right now. The and his lobby, wait, no. Impel down arc is less that 
because the ways in which they're like working through this prison have never been done before. And I'm not, I think that like this kind of attack on the Marines has never been attempted either. So this may be new, but like there is a point at which, uh, what is it? Sengoku's? Is that the name of the guy with the, the, um, the seagulls on the sides of his hat? There's a point when all of the ships come up from underwater and he literally says, why didn't we plan for this? And it just really felt like Oda trying to be like, look, 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 I know that they should have known. And y'all are going to ask why they didn't. And I've got to address it. They just didn't think of it. Okay. It felt like the sort of thing where he knows if I'm writing this with them actually being intelligent, they would have had people underwater keeping an eye out. They would have figured out a way to do that. You know, um, I'm sorry. David says there's a character who was introduced in Thriller Bark who alluded to someone who won't show up for dot, dot, dot so long. I won't say who on either end, only that you missed them. Oh, really? I missed them. Wait, that I missed them like, oh, I miss that guy. Or I missed them like they were on screen and I didn't see. I'm not sure which one you mean. I think you mean the first one. I took it as the second one initially, but uh, Sengoku is seagull sphere hair. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, so anyway, getting back to the thing, because, you know, um, I been talking a while about like some of the holes with this. All that said, though, it still was really effective. And it's so pitiful as things really begin to fall apart for poor Ors, how he keeps saying, don't worry, Ace, I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm almost there. I'm here. And I was just like, oh, this is really sad and painful. Like the childlike quality of the way he talks really lays it on. And there's just a sense overall of pathos. And the first person to go at him is fucking uh, Doflamingo. Is that his name? Um, and this dude, I have had just about enough of his fucking monologuing. Like he, <laughs> this dude is out here talking about how like we stand on, on the fulcrum of history and the basically long story short, history is written by the victors like this dude needs to stop it okay he is giving joe rogan he is giving like youtube bro guru that like isn't actually saying anything that deep or new but he words it in just such a way that people who are not very smart think he is and there is nothing more infuriating than a person who seems smart to stupid people. It's just agonizing. And the the whole like way that he, he's just got this smugness about him. I really hate this man. Truly. Like, thumbs down. Do not like. And he won't stop talking. He just keeps like fucking with his little commentary throughout the fighting and everything. Give it a rest, sir. Somebody turn his microphone off, okay? He doesn't need airtime. I don't want, like, just fast forward through his ads. Do not click subscribe and do not give him a thumbs up. He has too much ego already. We don't need to be encouraging any of this. I mean, just the, the kind of dude that he would pull people on for interviews and just ask them the most, like, esoteric questions that don't really even have an answer. Not because he gives a shit about the person he's interviewing and what they have to say, but because he wants to show off, like, his own intellect and answer his own question. With an equally vague and meaningless answer, by the way. I can't with this dude. He just kept pushing my buttons. There's just, mm, he's just like, this type, you know? And I don't think I really like realize this about him because we haven't seen him in a prolonged situation, really. There's been like, like one when we very first met him where it was a big meeting of all these other dudes and they were very intolerant of his bullshit. But it's different when he's around people who aren't really peers. It's even worse, you know? I can see why everybody else is just like, 
<sighs> this guy. Can we fucking get back to the meeting, please? Oh my god. Every time. Um <laughs> David says Dofi has the drippiest drip and then wrote, so, so Doflamingo is Andrew Tay. Okay. I'm not going to go that far. Oh, Florian. Yes, I do see the link. Thank you for that. I, uh, I clicked on it and it said that I don't have access. I think it might, I requested access. I think it's cause I am signed in under a different, uh, uh, account from Google. Apologies. Um, but it is working. Like it's, I was able to click it. So thank you. And I'm going to save it. Uh, but yeah, don't flamingo is Andrew. Like Andrew Tate's a literal sex trafficker. I wouldn't put it that far. I don't know though, because we do have fucking straight up like slavery. We do have human trafficking in this show. So what do I know? Maybe that's do flamingo's whole jam. Maybe he makes a bunch of money that way. So sure. Anybody listening I really hope that you know already this is an Andrew Tate hate account. Like I'm never, I I don't want to hear it. If there's anyone listening who's like, well, you know, Andrew Tate actually, they're planning to write a fucking email. Don't bother. Please not with the, the YouTube comments. I hate that man and he is trash and deserves to burn in hell for eternity. And I stand by that and I will never change my mind. I don't think there's a thing you could tell me about him that would ever make me go, oh, I had it all wrong. Nope. That's it. That's that. Um, no problem, Florian. Don't worry about it. I will, we'll, we'll figure it out. Um, but anyway, so yeah, this dude, ugh, he cuts off baby Orz's leg. Like, and, and the, the thing about it again is that Baby Oars has to be written with this, like, childlike cadence and understanding. And so you just hear him go, ouch, my foot. In the most, like, it's, it's, you, you don't see what's happened yet when he says that. And so it doesn't hit until you see that his leg is ending in a stump that you're like, oh my God, like, that's not his foot. That's his whole, like, knees down. And he begins to just teeter forward. Now, of course, is this enough to stop him? It is not. He is still pulling himself forward, reaching for Ace. There is a whole lot. I really wonder about this with the voice actors. Like, do they, how, how much of this do they actually do? And how much of it is like, oh, we just have like a soundboard full of like whimpering, groaning, agonized sounds that we just cut in when we need them. Because if they have to do this every time for every episode, I feel like that must get old so fast. Because it's just, uh, for most of these episodes, all Ace is doing is either saying no, or stop and don't and then in between that he's going and that must really be tiresome to record and just making sure that all the sounds you're making last for enough time and you know like it just it must be very difficult as a voice actor so we get a lot of that interspersed with Orr's attempting to continue like walking forward. All of, all of these like Marines, like the vanilla Marines, not the ones with like real powers or anything. They're really not getting out of the way adequately. They're just sort of watching this guy coming at them. And like, they're assuming, I guess, that he's not going to get there in time to crush them, that he's going to fall long before he reaches where they are. But they're like trusting way too much in that, considering the resilience that this dude has been shown to have already. And so they're just like watching him come near them. And then as he begins to like topple over, they're yelling and running. And I'm like, yeah, you really should have. You should have made room. That should have been the first thing you did. And whatever happens, you're hoping this guy gets taken down. If he gets taken down, which down do you think he's going in? 
You don't think he's going to try and fall in your direction on purpose because it's like the least he could do. And that's like literally what he's saying as he's falling is like, well, if I can't save Ace, the least I can do is take out one of the warlords. So he's out here fucking focused. This Ors has a mission and he's going to stick to it. And he's falling. And as this is like all happening and he's still struggling, half falling, half pulling and like crawling himself forward. Fucking Moria is over here like, I can't believe this doe fucking flamingo cut the leg off my baby. That asshole. Like, it's like, you. it's like the sort of thing where I'm trying to get a certain stuffed animal at a carnival and I'm saying like, oh, I want that one specifically. And then the game is that you have to like shoot an arrow into a stuffed animal and you shoot it into the one that I specifically said I wanted. Why are you like this? Oh my God. Now I'm fully on Doflamingo's side in that. I don't give a shit about your little fucking like ham puppet collection, sir. I am not interested in contributing to your bizarre fetish shit. That's your business. You figure it out. You need to supply up. Go do that on your own time. We have a war we're fighting. This man was about to like eat half our troops, probably. I am doing what I need to do. And the fact that you're throwing a little tantrum that I put a a hole in your jacket and now you need to patch it up. I am so sorry to interrupt your planning ahead for playtime with an actual battle. Wow. Yeah. How could I do that to you? So anyway, this point, Moria unleashes an attack. I don't remember having seen this before. I may be just forgetting. Have we seen this shadow lizard? It's like shadow spiky lizard or something like that. And it's basically like a blade of darkness that is ha- it's like a tiny little lizard made of shadow on the but it's like tail you could either say it as like its tail is huge or it's like impaled on the end of a very very large blade i don't know which one you'd want to go with but i'm sorry guys if you can hear my cat she is really needy um but this thing it's tipped with the the lizard so like moria shoots this darkness up through the bottom of orz's chin like his throat what do you call this part between your actual chin and your throat what is that the base of your skull no that's back here i don't even know what you call this exactly um but anyway it goes up through that like soft tissue And out the top of his head. And he's still talking, by the way, as this is all happening to him. So it doesn't instantly kill him. But there is a point where his eyes go white and lifeless. And it really seems like he's actually dead. I have a hard time believing that. The only reason that I would say he could actually be dead is because he's not technically human. And it seems like those are the characters that Oda's okay with killing. Mostly he is okay with like the non-humans dying mostly. And that's the only reason that I might be like, maybe he is dead, but I just, I don't know. I kind of feel like he might make it out the other side. Cause we've seen the eyes go white like this. And I've thought people were dead, dead. And it turned out they were not. But it doesn't really matter. It's like that end game isn't the point. What we're focused on here is the impact of it. And everybody like who knows Ors just being devastated because he is a sweetie pie. And the fact that he just refused to concede, no matter what was being done, he's still coming at them. He's still heading for Ace and he's still going to do what he can. And... It's a sacrifice, you know, and it's kind of like a fucked up thing, but like a nice thing that later on 
when Whitebeard is yelling for everybody to like go over, like run over his body, you could see it. It's like he's telling the crew to literally like walk all over his dead corpse. But you know for a fact that if Orr's spirit was standing there telling them what to do, he'd be like, oh yeah, please, perfect. At least I can be of service. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a great bridge. Awesome. I'm glad I could do something. You know, I feel like he would be 100% down with that. No problem with it whatsoever. In fact, I would be surprised if he had not served as an actual bridge to his friends in life. You know, they come to an island and there's a gorge that they need to cross. And he just like steps down into it and like, you know, bends and lets them walk over his shoulders. Like, I feel like that's something that he probably has done. So this is how the... Whitebeard crew really gets into the mix, like on the land. I don't know if you call it land because it's like it's the, been sort of a weird thing with the uh, last few locations that we have come to, from Ennis Lobby to Impel Down, now to this like particular. We've been to a, a Marine headquarters, but this is a different level of one. I don't know. Is this just called World Government Headquarters? Or is there another name for this spot? I don't... I'm sorry, guys, if I I missed something. But um, it's sort of a weird thing where the buildings are the islands themselves. Like, there is almost no land around the buildings. They're not, like, built on islands. It really feels like if there's an island there, it was put in place for a building to be built on it. It doesn't feel like the buildings were like a, a the second thing. They were the first idea. And so I keep being like a little bit weird about how I talk about the location because I'm saying, you know, when they reach land and they haven't exactly reached like land, I, but they have, it's a stationary thing. So I guess that's adequate, but I don't know if they're kind of considered almost like mega ships of their own, um, like city ships, something like that. Um, oh, Florian says it's called Marine Ford and it is their main base, their HQ. Okay. Uh, <laughs> David, thank you for seeing the duality of Dof- Dofi. Dofi. I don't know why, but that's really funny. Um, but anyway, that's, you know, how they managed to really get onto the main battlefield. And I'm going to back up a little bit here because uh, there's a whole thing with Kobe. What are, what are we doing with this? I'm sure it's going to pay off. You know, I am trust that. But from where I'm standing right now, this is the weirdest little offshoot. I feel like there's probably been other times, but they're escaping my notice when, but there's, there's probably been, but I don't feel like it's happened very often where somebody who is such a little side character, we just like check in with them and they're doing essentially nothing. Every single time that we wind up checking in with Kobe He's freaking out because he feels helpless and can't do anything. And like the only things that change are one, what's making him feel helpless and like he can't do anything. Sometimes it's just his own self-doubt. It's seeing some other pair fighting or, you know, he comes across this like fucking weirdo who kills one of his own men because he says that if the guy's running, then it's better for him to die than shame his family kind of thing. And I, I don't, know where he he has the very anime moment where he's told you can't do anything you've got to stay behind and stay out of the fucking way and he like punches the ground while crying angrily i love this by the way like it is such an anime trope i I'm sure that it's also done in live action, but when I imagine this move, I am imagining uh, several different scenes, I think, from Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood. So, anyway, 
uh, the the whole deal with Kobe is him and Hal Meppo, um, and the two of them like trying to simultaneously get out of the way and find anything that they can do. There's a couple of stops within there where they talk about how Luffy is so selfless and like, you know, what he is willing to give up and just being in general impressed with him. But, uh, that there's not a lot of forward movement with Kobe. And, you know, I'm, I don't even really want to say that I don't like it because, I am pr- trusting that it will pay off and we don't spend too terribly much time with him. It's not that bad, but it is just sort of like, I feel like this could have been done a different way. <laughs> um, Florian says, yeah, the Kobe thing is weird. I look for looking forward to hearing what you think of it. All right. Well, I'm looking forward to telling you there's nothing sexier to me than someone being like, I'm really excited to hear your opinion. That's why I have the job that I have. It's the best. Um, okay. So talked about Kobe, talked about Oars, uh, and I guess let's talk about Garp here. Garp is in this weird position where he, I know, can you just, yeah, see, I shouldn't have even engaged. Now she won't stop. Um, Garp is remembering going to pick Ace up and, it's really sweet. Like he reacts to picking up Ace for the first time as if he is his own son. There's a real like sentimental look in his eye and it's just like all hearts and everything around him. It's just really adorable. And (laughs) David says, I think your cat has opinions on Garp. Hey, Ripley. Yeah. Do you like Garp or no? Meow if you like Garp. She, She shut up. When I said that, she stopped. Oh my God, she does have opinions about Garp. I'm going to have to bring you on as a guest later. Um, anyway, but he has Garp and we kind of like, I don't remember, I don't think we ever see the circumstances under which he picks Luffy up, do we? So we've got that still as sort of a mystery. We just know that eventually Luffy is like brought home to be with him and well I say home at that point they're not living with Garp anymore because they've been sent somewhere else um I don't remember if it's at this point that like Garp has gotten too many promotions and they're gonna find that his kids are suspect or what um but it was really making something like in the in the live action uh mild spoilers for that but there are some scenes where you see garp raising luffy and ace i don't think you meet ace though i think he's suggested but i don't know if you do you see him i don't think so um but you see him at least raising luffy and being really pissed that luffy wants to become a pirate And by the time I watched the live action, I had not gotten to like this stuff yet. So I wasn't even like totally aware how much raising he did that there, you know, they had enough time together for there to be this kind of scene between them. But even if I knew that, I was quite taken aback at how vehement he was right from the beginning at Luffy not becoming a pirate. Like the way... The, the type of anger he showed in that scene fell out of proportion to just being like, but pirates are bad. You don't want to do that. And it wasn't like, I was actually still willing to accept it. It felt out of proportion, but it felt appropriate for the tone of the show with how much like stuff is over the top. So I didn't really question it very much, but now realizing who his father and Ace's father are, And the, you know, whole way that they went down and how much he's been trying to, like, honor the promises he's made by raising these kids in, like, a decent way. And now they may just go down the exact same road. Yeah, that would be very scary and, like, a fulfillment of your worst case scenario. So I understand a lot better now why he was having the reaction that he was having in that scene. Um, So... The, there's an eventual moment when 
Garth like connects with Ace again. He like goes up onto the platform and we wind up finding out that basically like the Marines have decided, well, all hell has broken loose. We are not sticking to the plan. We had like hours before we were going to execute him. Why would we wait until then now? Like, we'll just go ahead and do it. And Garp goes to see Ace and just say his goodbyes. And he, you know, there's a real sense of like affection coming from Ace. He just, he feels like, I wouldn't say that he regrets what he's done because like he doesn't. Ace, if he knew where he wound up, would do all of the shit over again exactly in the same way. Is there any doubt in anybody's mind? Like, come on, of course. So I'm not trying to say like he regrets what he's done. I think he is just regretting putting someone he really does actually care about through this. He's certainly got his issues with Garp. They're a complicated relationship for sure. But I don't, I think that Ace is soft hearted enough at this point, especially after seeing what so many people are willing to sacrifice for him, that it is meaning a lot to have everyone here rooting for him. And even the person who shouldn't be rooting for him is admitting like, this sucks. I really wish like that there was another way, you know? And part of me is like, is Garp up there because he's going to try and help at the last second to like help Ace make a break for it? Is he going to betray the Marines? I, I wouldn't hate that. You know, like I'm not, I don't, really, really totally want that because there is something interesting about the conflict of interest and having a man on the inside, but maybe we've just gone as far as we can with that. And maybe he's like a part of the plot and that I'm 100% here for, just like for the record. Um, and meanwhile, fucking Sengoku is over here like, oh, you have the, the gall to expect sympathy from me no nobody thought that you weren't part of this dude they were having a moment it's not about you and your weird voyeur shit why do you need to be a part of this like intimate family the guy's about to die Shh. Shh. stop it gross he makes me so mad. I do not like him. His whole energy, it's like, it's really giving like Percy Weasley, like a tough Percy Weasley, like a badass, but also fuck you. You, you, you teacher's pet being ass bitch. So that's my assessment today of Sengoku and Doflamingo. So there you go. Um, David says Sengoku is there to make sure Garp doesn't spring Ace out of jail. I'm sure he is. I don't like him inserting himself into the conversation. Garp wasn't, they were just talking. Garp wasn't even like reaching down to take his hand in a suspicious manner. Just observe and don't involve yourself in the conversation. Don't say anything. Let it be. Have a little mercy. But I think it's clear that it's not a man who really gives a shit about that kind of thing. Um, so, oh my God, you guys, the, there's like a sort of like glacier, I guess you want to say iceberg, uh, that is blocking other ships from getting through to the mainland, so to speak. And we see a ship captained by Whitey Bay, a dope-ass looking pirate captainess. I'm just going to call her a pirate captain. I do like captainess, even though I know adding S or et to the end of words to feminize them can feel really like dim diminutizing almost. I don't really feel that way. I think they sound really cool with that. Like so talking about a murderess, 
I'm sorry. That just sounds cool as hell. So I don't have a problem with it. And I want to make it clear when I call her a captainess, even though I am certain that word is not real, I mean it with the utmost respect. I love it. And her outfit, beauty. I'm like the whole like ice colors she's got like all like pastel purple and green and blue and and white and it just looks so awesome i love this outfit and i really am worried that we're like not gonna get to see very much of her i want her to be more of a thing this is the tricky thing for me as a woman watching this show is that there's always like a woman there's 13 dudes and a woman and every time so far the woman's been the weak link like, it's kind of sucked. So I really want a female pirate captain to be the main event in some arc. Like, pretty significant, you know? I don't know how that would work. But, and I, I just, even like uh, Alvita, she wound up kind of being like the second hand to buggy for most of the show she starts off with her own thing going on and then she winds up like whatever happens with like her ship or and so she has like teamed up with someone and then that's how she stays until right before it fell down where we see her like i think she just basically like steals buggy's crew if i'm not mistaken and it's just like, who the fuck's going to check me? And now I'm like hoping that she does get back to her own thing. I, I just want to, I miss that heart ship so fucking much. I think about that ship every time I think of the show. That's the first image that pops into my mind because it made such an impression when I was watching the first episode and had no idea what was going on. And I saw that ship and I was like, okay, I'm in here we go. Let's do this. Like that was the thing that convinced me. So having it just be over that fast is still very heartbreaking. And I just, you know, we can have do a new version of it, but I want it back. I just loved it. And still thinking I'm going to go as her for Halloween this year. Now that I've like seen the show and everything, that's going to be a very like simple, easy cosplay, immediately recognizable. And Owen can go as another character, which we could do a whole lot with that. Uh, suggestions, please, to those who know what Owen looks like to tell me which One Piece character he should cosplay as. Um, he could be a pretty good Garp if you put gray in his hair. I don't... Garp can get it, so maybe we could just do a, a hot Garp. Um, anyway, okay. I feel like I actually, in my weird around the bush way of doing this talked about pretty much everything um oh no last thing of course luffy's crew and how they fell from the sky this is one of my favorite uses of the like voiceover narrator that they've ever done mostly he just like says things in such a way that it's informative, but it's not like engaging with the audience. I really love whenever there's a moment of like in this one, like, so you might be wondering why Luffy and his friends are falling from the sky. And then later on, you after the whole story is laid out about what happened, it ends with him going, so that is is why Luffy and his friends are falling from the sky. And it cracked me up. I loved it. <laughs> but anyway, so what happens is when they do the tsunami thing, their ship gets pulled back, but there's like a wave that's been frozen in place. And so they get pulled up to the top and stuck on like the icy top. And Luffy is determined to shift the ship so that they can fall down the other side and the there i can't remember like the plan and how it was supposed to go but long story short he breaks this the side of the wave that's like in the wrong direction and it basically s sends them careening through the sky so that's the point when like 
how Meppo and Kobe look up and they're like, wow, he's, uh, he's really coming in. Okay. It's like, he's in midair. Everybody's yelling. And he says to himself, I'm going to be fine. I'm made of rubber. And Mr. Three is like, oh my God, how about the rest of us? You selfish asshole. What the fuck are you? What the fuck is your plan for us? This was not how I thought I was going to die. And I did find that really funny because like Luffy can be very self-absorbed in a different way. But when it's everyone's like safety, that doesn't usually feel like a thing that complete like doesn't cross his mind at all. So I did enjoy this guy being like, wow, fuck you too, my friend. Um, I love to when we jump from like different people and their reactions to everything mihawk is just like oh god this kid is such a pain in the ass every time with this guy and then we get boa hancock who's like oh luffy i'm so glad you're okay and i was just like okay can you know, oh, i'm kind of over that um Smokey, Smokey, oh my god, I'm so sorry, Smoker, is wondering what Luffy and Crocodile are, like, paired up, like, how, what they're doing together, and it turns out that Crocodile is out here to kill, uh, Whitebeard, and I thought that he would, like, work his way up to doing that once this immediate issue is taken care of, because that feels like, for him as well, the better way to handle the situation killing white beard when you're in the midst of a very clear us versus them situation in which the us right now is mostly gathered behind his standard and is winning for i'm gonna say that that seems what it's like right now why would you kill the guy in charge now that feels foolish and, like, it might just be an opportunistic thing because he says, like, you should have kept your guard up. But it really felt like the plan. It felt like he was totally intending the instant that he got anywhere near Whitebeard. That was it. He was just going to go for it. And I'm just like, do you know what's going to happen when everybody who's, like, on your side right now thinks you've killed their captain and you're fucking still standing there? You don't think they're just going to, like, completely body slam you? And take you down? I mean, I guess he must just be that confident that there's not going to be a way for them to take him down. But it just felt like really, really short-sighted. Just wait until you've gotten out of here, my guy. And he thinks you're more of a an ally. And then do it. You know? Gain his trust and then stab him in the back. What the fuck? I thought we all knew how this goes. Um. So... Let's see, just making sure that I've gotten everything. I just, again, really enjoy everybody's reactions. There's a moment when <laughs> when Gecko Moria screeches, Is that Straw Hat? And I fell out because everybody else is like well aware. Luffy's still out there in the mix. Like everybody else is like seen or had run-ins with him but like mori is the most recent that was a, a like non-government official big bad so i just imagined it as like moria got pulled to this meeting where all the head honchos are he is not up on his info because he felt confident enough about how things went with luffy that he was like well he didn't make it out of that even though like you woke up passed out on the lawn of your busted property and you hadn't gotten the memo about the fact that this kid has been out and about Nobody wants to talk about, like, the break-in at Impel Down. Everybody seems to be very, very, very silent on that. So I imagine it as, like, he really thought he was done with this kid, and then he just sees him, like, sailing through the air and is like, you fucks. Oh, my God. And uh, he is government-ish, but that's why I said he's, like, he's not an official government agent. Because everybody since him has been, like, on the payroll very openly in the uniform and he's really like the last one that we dealt with that wasn't part of that crew ever since uh 
everybody's been like sent in different directions from that island. Luffy's been just on his own fighting Impel Down and what was the other one? And his lobby. Right? Or no, and his lobby came before that. Impel Down was after. Because we had rescued Robin by then. Right. Anyway. But am I wrong about that? I feel like that's the timing. Um, anyway, anyway, anyway. As my cat so desperately is trying to remind me. I really do have to wrap up. Uh, I do like as well that when Luffy lands and Whitebeard is just like, if you fucking, with your nerve, get in my way and ruin this, I will fuck you up. And Luffy just being like, who the fuck are you? I'm going to do what I want. And I'm going to save his ass. Thanks for nothing. And I just kind of like the fact that even though they're on the same side, technically, they are already kind of annoyed with each other. I just like that. Um, so, okay. I am going to wrap that up. Oh, that was only Luffy. But yes, you're right, Florian. Uh, everybody, Florian pointed out the other big bad being Boa, who I kind of don't count because there's like the combo of the fact of how much she fell in love with Luffy, like right away, but also that that was like Luffy's sort of weird side quest thing. Uh, all his friends got one from where they landed and he sort of got one too, but that's true. So I'm going to give you that. Um, all right, everybody. Thank you again so much for listening. Really enjoyed these episodes. These this weird show and until next time toodaloo motherfuckers Spoiled Network Podcast.